we just as we do uh, you heard the announcement for choir that's for Christmas choir and we know some there may be some say well I can't be part of it this time or whatever that's okay if you're part of the Christmas choir we'll meet this afternoon and I, w I do want to say one other thing about the ladies meeting as well they are just especially for this time meeting in Discovery Bay that's not uh, that's not their uh, standard venue but if you are free on Wednesdays and you'd like to be part of a really good in-depth intimate ladies Bible study do talk with these ladies afterwards and as Pastor Renee said please do pray for us as we go we've been thinking as we're thinking about the wedding upcoming and everything we've been trying to figure out how are we going to light 17 unity candles <laughs> for that's part of it that's part of 30, 34 candles and then 17 unity candles in the in the front so that and other things we're still trying to to um, to figure out um, you know, we, we look at, at Vivian, uh, we're going to continue with Barnabas this morning, by the way, and, and we'll, we'll see how far we get. But we look at Vivian, and something really struck me this last week or so. You know, we, we look at ministry so often, and we think, I can't do that. I'm not qualified. It's, it's too difficult. It must be for somebody else to do. And we look, as we consider Vivian here, in northern Philippines she is working with the Atas tribe and then also with the group there in Wawang and I realized about a week and a half ago Vivian is not even an Ilocano speaker she's not she's a Tagalog speaker and she has started a church there and I, I asked Pastor Renee how does she preach she's not even an Ilocano speaker and they don't really have someone to translate do they and he said, well, she's just picked up enough words to, to be able to share simply with them. And because of that, many, many people are going to go to heaven instead of hell. Eternally, for eternity, they will be with God. Because a woman who was not very educated and who didn't have a lot of resources, we have not financially supported Vivian in the way that we have the others who are single and who doesn't speak the language nevertheless saw the need and said as Isaiah said here I am send me I'm willing I'm willing God can do anything with a person who's willing he's, he's he can do anything he is not looking for, I've got to have somebody who has all the language. I've got to have somebody who knows just the right culture, although he can use those things. I've got to have somebody who can do this and who, that and who's specially trained, although he can use those things. God is looking for people who are willing. That's where God starts. That's where God starts. And if you and I are willing, God can do anything he wants to with us if we're willing. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Barnabas was willing. That was a nice segue, wasn't it? And we're going to turn again to Barnabas and we'll see how the timing goes. Uh, I was telling Pastor Renee when we looked at Barnabas a couple of weeks ago, I told him, I said, that's one of the hardest services I have ever preached. It was a service of distractions. Do you remember that? Two weeks ago. You remember it too, don't you? There was this and there was that and there was also there. All, then we had the worst smell we've ever had coming through the air cons, but Praise the Lord and God bless Brother Kim and Brother Lau for figuring it out and coming here and doing the dirty work. So, Lord willing, we're not going to be distracted today as we look at as we look at Barnabas. Uh, as I was praying and preparing yesterday, I said, "Well, Lord, if you want me to go in a different direction, I'm happy to do that." But I really feel uh, the Lord would have for us to finish up with Barnabas this morning, and uh, we meet him. Uh, he's, the, he's nicknamed Barnabas, the son of encouragement, in Acts 40, 4, 34 through 37. And this is in the early days of the church. And in the early days of the church, there's this beautiful description of what is going on. And it says they were bringing money to the apostles to give to those in need. The Bible says that they would bring the money and lay it at the feet of the apostles. So it was done very publicly. At that time, they didn't do what we do now. We have a, a special, we take up an offering, and we, we have our way of doing it. But at, at that time, it was just as the Lord led, and as He touched their hearts, then they would bring. And Joseph, nicknamed Barnabas, 
which means son of encouragement, was, was one of those from the tribe of Levi, from the island of Cyprus, and he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. So Barnabas was likely fairly well to do. We don't, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot, but if he is, if he was able to, to, if he had property and then could sell it, even though he was a Levite, so there are things that we don't know about it, but he brought it and he brought the money to the apostles for those who were in need. So we have this story of Barnabas. We meet him for the first time. Some people say he was one of the early converts and that he was there even on the day of Pentecost. Maybe he was one of the 120 in the upper room. Others say, well, no, maybe on the day of Pentecost because he was from Cyprus. He heard them praising the Lord in his own language and then uh, he believed also and was baptized and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't tell us those things, but what it does tell us is that there was something in him that the apostles saw and said, he is a Barnabas, he's an encourager. Can the same be said of you and me? Maybe encouragement is not your strongest gift, but can people look at you and your life as a Christian and can they say something about you in the same way? This is one who's always speaking good things. This is one who's always uh, helping those in need. This is one who is serving behind the scenes. Can those things be said about you? They should be able to be said about every person who is a child of God because God the Holy Spirit comes to live in us and change us and make us into His image and put His gifts in us that then are used for the church and for the body of Christ. And so they see Barnabas and they say, ha! He's not really a Joseph. He's a son of encouragement. And that's the reputation. That's how he acts, and that's the reputation he has. And then we lose sight. So other people are doing it, as I've mentioned before. Other people were also giving, selling property, houses and land, and bringing it for those in need. But the Holy Spirit chooses this one, Barnabas, on whom to shine a light because he is going to be instrumental in the growth and the development of the church. Not just this one time. And God's pleased with just this one time, but there's more than that. He is going to be uh, someone who is part of the foundation of this early church. But then we lose sight of Barnabas for all of these chapters in, in the book of Acts, and we lose sight of him until Acts chapter 9. And we see in 926, we, see, we meet Saul then, and, and we know what has happened in the intervening chapters. We know that uh, the church has grown, many miracles happen, the apostles are preaching, the, hit, the sick are healed, and then persecution breaks out, and Stephen is martyred. He's stoned to death. And the Bible tells us so clearly, and Saul was there giving his approval. So he was in leadership in some way. And then we meet Saul again because he has met Jesus. And in Acts 9, 26, he comes to Jerusalem. He tries to meet with the believers, but they're afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. His reputation is so bad, really, that nobody believes God could change his life. Wow. That tells me two things. Saul must have been really, really, really bad, and the believers perhaps didn't really understand the power of God to change a life. You know, in your life and my life, you may know someone who is almost like a Saul, who is a persecutor of Christians, who despises God and who mocks the church and who mocks God's followers. Don't give up on this person. If Saul can be changed, the person that you know as a Saul in your life can also be changed. And into this scene and into this setting, we again meet Barnabas. And aren't you glad there was a Barnabas there at that time? And here's Barnabas, who is willing to put his reputation on the line, who is willing to give a chance to someone, who is willing with eyes of faith to see a Saul and look not at what he was, but at what he is and what he can be in the hands of God. That's the heart of a Barnabas. That's what an encourager does. An encourager looks at us, broken as we are and messed up as we are and imperfect as we are, and see. And a Barnabas can see in us there's hope. You will be a Paul. You can be used in the hands of God. And a Barnabas is willing to extend grace. A Barnabas is willing to believe. A Barnabas is willing to trust and have faith that our lives 
will not be as they were, but as it will be in the future, in the hands of God. Aren't you and I glad that at that moment there was a Barnabas in the Jerusalem church who could look at Saul and tell others, let's give him a chance. Let's receive him. He is one of us. He's part of the family of God. And that the church was forever changed because Barnabas was willing to accept Saul and encourage him and encourage others to bring him into the church. Then, as we said before, uh, you know, murder plots and violence followed Paul all his life um, because he was such a zealot for the Lord. And so he leaves Jerusalem again, and we know that he goes away, and the spotlight goes off Saul, who's not yet named Paul, and the spotlight again goes off Barnabas. What's going on? We don't know. But we can guess some things. The Bible does not tell us what Barnabas is doing in these silent years, but by what he does later, what we can say is this. Barnabas in the church is continuing to be faithful. He's remaining an encourager because a little bit later on when his name crops up again, we will see him continuing and doing the same thing that he did when we first met him, encouraging the church and encouraging those in need. So the church continues to grow. Um, Saul becomes a Christian, but because of the persecution, as we said before, the church in Jerusalem, except for the apostles, are scattered, and something begins to happen. As the disciples, not as the, as, as the believers are scattered throughout Asia and through these different cities, something begins to happen. And I want us to read in Acts 11, 19 through 20. What happens is exactly what Jesus said would happen when his followers received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what Jesus said in Acts 1.8? We've got this up. Believe this up. Remember what Jesus told his apostles and his followers and his disciples? You wait here in Jerusalem. You will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. And now here we have, chapters later, God's word proves true. God's word never fails. And chapters later, who knows how much later, we we see exactly what Jesus said would happen. It happens. And they begin to go as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. There were two Antiochs. This is the one that we're looking at. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. And I want you to see something that I hadn't really noticed so much. I, I like these verses because... What you see here, it's not the apostles. It's not the deacons. It's not Philip the evangelist who then goes off in Samaria and there's this great revival. It's nobody named whatsoever. It's just the believers. They preach the word of God. You don't have to be a leader in the church to preach the word of God. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit to preach the word of God. You preach the word of God by how you live. You preach the word of God by how you talk with your co-workers, by how you talk and interact with your family. They preached the word of God and then they went to Antioch from Cyprus, those from Cyprus and Cyrene, and they began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus and what happens? Acts 11, 21. And we see that the power of the Lord was with them. Why? Because Jesus said that his power would rest upon them as they did his work. If you're going to do the work of the Lord, and if I'm going to do the work in the, of the Lord, it has to be in the power of the Lord. That's the only way that it's going to be successful in God's eyes. That's the only way lives are going to be changed. Oh, we can get anybody to church once or twice if we say, oh, we've got a special program, come. And that's great. We want people to come. But it is not coming to church that will change people's lives. It is the Lord Jesus Christ coming into a life, coming into a heart, transforming them, giving them new life that will change lives. And so we see the power of the Lord was with them. And when the power of the Lord is with you, things will happen. Lives will be changed. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. This wonderful picture of revival God's way. 
which is a lot like what Pastor Rene was describing at the top of the mountain with the Atas. The power of the Lord was with them as they went in that medical mission. The power of the Lord was with Vivian as she went up there and just began to share love with them and talk with them. Very simple, not trained as a preacher. Not, never even, Vivian, never even was very much part of Sunday mornings at Lighthouse because she had to work on Sundays. Most of Vivian's training was Wednesday evening Bible studies, pretty much. That was pretty much it. But the power of the Lord was with her. And the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of the Gentiles believed. Now, you're probably wondering, what about Barnabas? Aren't we talking about Barnabas? Yes, we are. We're talking about Barnabas. So this is going on in Antioch. Antioch was the third most important city in the Roman Empire. Rome was number one, Alexandria was the second, and then Antioch of Syria was the third most important city in the Roman Empire. So this is a big deal. Have Gentiles already turned to the Lord? Yes. In Acts chapter 10, remember Cornelius, the Roman centurion, uh, the, the Roman cap army captain who was a devout follower of God and he and his household uh, followed certain Jewish customs and they prayed and they gave alms to the poor and then Peter came and preached to them and they believed and the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, this, on them in the same way as it had been to the disciples, the Jews. So we already have this step into the Roman world beyond Jews. But as I look at that, and then I look at what happens, um, and here we have, here's, here's Cornelius the captain, but we see already in the life of Cornelius, there's a certain turning to God already, isn't there? He's already, it's not following Jesus, he's just following what he knows to follow of the Jewish, of the Jewish, of a monotheistic religion, and he's doing all he knows to do. And so, in a way, with Cornelius, it's a little bit, it's not as drastic or not as dramatic, although this was a huge step. But when we come to the revival in Antioch, it is an even greater step into the pagan world because Antioch was one, it was known as a city of low morals, of loose morals. It was known as a city right outside the city. There was a shrine to Apollo and his lover Daphne, the, some of the gods, and part of that was part of that the worship of, of Apollo and Daphne involved a lot of temple prostitutes very well accepted in the city it was it was an it was a, a it was a sinful city it was a sinful city and into this sinful city in such a situation p the power of God is poured out and people's lives begin to begin to change from darkness to light dramatic changes as, as the power of God is poured out now what happens? What is the church in Jerusalem going to do? They're the mother church. They hear about the revival. What are they going to do? Nothing? Well, praise God that there's a blessing over there. No. They take their responsibility very seriously. They remember that Jesus said, you will go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And they hear about this revival breaking out in Antioch. And they said, let's send somebody to Antioch. We need to send somebody to, to see how things are going and to do what? Encourage the new believers. And it is then that we meet Barnabas again. Acts 11, 22. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. That tells me that Barnabas has maintained his testimony of faithfulness and encouragement. They could have sent anybody. Peter was in the church at Jerusalem. He was one of the leaders and he wasn't the only one. James, the half-brother of Jesus, there were others that were there in the church at Jerusalem as well. There was actually even one of the deacons of the church, Nicanor, and you can go, you say, what, what, what? Go back and read the book of Acts. We won't, we won't look there on our own today. But he himself was an early convert from Antioch. Why didn't they send him? They choose Barnabas. Why do they choose Barnabas? Because he was an encourager. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. When there is a new believer, a baby Christian that comes into the church, or there's a new church that's established, you need Barnabases. You need encouragers. Because encouragers are the ones that come alongside that new Christian that may be full of excitement and full of zeal, but doesn't know a lot. 
and who may still be struggling with all sorts of issues in his or her life because he's just gotten saved. There may be all sorts of things. You need an encourager. You don't need someone who's going to come along and say, oh, well, now that you're a Christian, you can't do this and you can't do this. And oh, you definitely shouldn't be doing that because you're a Christian now. <laughs> For it's true. It's true. Now, are there standards of holiness and righteousness? Absolutely. That is part of becoming a Christian and growing up in God and being made into the image of Jesus. That's part of it. But that's not all of it. There are other things that are part of it as well. And they choose Barnabas. And that tells me that Barnabas is an encourager still. Barnabas is the right man for the job. Exactly the right man. Are you a Barnabas? When new Christians come into the church, when young ones come in, are you a Barnabas to them? Or do you sit back and say, hmm. <laughs> Their dress really is too short. <laughs> Still wearing too much makeup. Hmm. Did you see where they went? I saw where they were going. <sighs> there will be changes and God requires holiness. He does. He does. But especially for new ones that come into the church, let the Holy Spirit do His work in their lives. Let the Holy Spirit clean them up on the inside. And when the Holy Spirit cleans people up on the inside, He'll take care of the outside. He'll take care of the outside and they won't stumble and they won't be offended, but they'll continue to grow in the Lord. So Barnabas was the right person. Now, by the way, let me say something. Those of you who say, oh, phew, good, so I can keep on doing what I'm doing. No. <laughs> if you have been following the Lord for a while and you've been growing and you should have been growing in the Lord and there are things in your life that are not pleasing to the Lord and you know they're not pleasing to the Lord, then you need to let the Holy Spirit work in your life and make some changes because there's, there's not an excuse for that. You understand what I'm saying, right? Amen. Okay. So Barnabas is sent. He's just the right man for the job. And what do we, what do we see? Acts 11, 23 and 24. Is he going to go there and say, oh, you bunch of heathens, you're still doing this. Is he going to say, oh, never mind, never mind. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Or is he going to preach a balanced message of encouragement? This is what we see. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy. And I can tell you something. When he saw all of these young believers, these new believers, I can promise you these believers weren't all cleaned up and all fixed up yet and all like Jesus yet. But what he saw was real. There was evidence of the life of God. And because of that, he could rejoice. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then what happens? He encouraged, oh, there we have the word again, right? He encouraged the believers to do what? Stay true to the Lord. Oh, that's encouraging. That helps me as well. Stay true to the Lord. Why? Because in the heat of the moment, in the first fervor of coming to the Lord, there can be great excitement, great joy. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But how many of you know that it's not always that way as you continue to walk with the Lord? There will be times when the excitement, there will be times when the great joy gives way to... I should read my Bible. I should pray. There are disciplines of the Christian life. And Barnabas comes in. He rejoices. He doesn't rain on their parade. You understand that expression, right? He doesn't rain on their parade. He sees what it is and he says, this is real. This is God. And he rejoices and he worships with them. Here's this Jew of Jews, Barnabas. And he comes right into this situation with all of these Gentile believers. And he rejoices and he worships with them. And then what does he say? Stay true to the Lord and in comes the balance the other part of the message there is a standard of righteousness there's a standard of holiness now that you have been born again walk with the Lord and this is how you walk with the Lord and I love it because we see the result of the work of Barnabas verse 24 Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith do you know what if you compare this description of Barnabas all the way back Go back and find Stephen. 
find the description of Stephen, do you know what you will find? Exactly the same, word for word. The way that Stephen is described is exactly the same way that Barnabas is described. He is full of the Holy Spirit, strong in the faith, a good man. And the result of his life and of Barnabas' teaching is what? And many people were brought to the Lord. Many people were brought to the Lord. Here we see Barnabas comes. He, says, he sees evidence of the grace of God, and he goes to work. Are you that type of Barnabas? You can be. You should be. I can be, and I should be as well. And so we see Barnabas, and he stays there. Many people were brought to the Lord. So we see the work of God through him. And now I want you to notice something else. What happens next? And I'm skipping. <laughs> I'm skipping a lot. Barnabas in Antioch. Let me put it in worldly terms for just a minute. Barnabas is the star at Antioch. Yes? He is the big preacher from Jerusalem. Yes? He has been sent from the mother church. He's the main man. He's the head guy. And there's a great revival. Now, what does he do? Does he stay there? And write letters back to Jerusalem? Oh, there's a mighty revival. God is using me. All my gifts are being displayed in the church. Many people are coming to the Lord. That's not the nature of Barnabas. Here's this great revival. God is blessing. People are coming to the Lord. And what does he do? What does he do? He leaves. He leaves Antioch. Why would Barnabas leave Antioch? Acts 11, 25, and 26. And then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. Do you see that? Here's Barnabas. God is using him in a mighty way. He's getting the glory. People are noticing him. But because Barnabas is an encourager, he has, the, he has a heart big enough and eyes large enough to see that other people have gifts that can be used in this situation. And the person with a heart of encouragement, a Barnabas will always be this way. A Barnabas will not hold on to and say, this is my ministry now. I'm the one that does this. No, you go somewhere else. No, this is what I'm doing. This is my ministry. Barnabas, and, and, I, and I'm stressing that because you know what? We see it in church all along. This is my ministry, and there's a possessiveness, and this is what I'm doing. There's a jealousy, and you feel like, well, somebody else is trying to step in my territory. The heart of Barnabas will always be open to the giftings of other people. And when our hearts are open to the giftings of other people, God will bring more people in. Their gifts will complement our gifts, and all the gifts that God gives will build up and will benefit the church, and the church will grow. The church will grow. That's the plan of God. That's how God does it. Barnabas goes on, and then he goes to Tarsus, and he looks for Saul. Do you know why he looks for Saul? He remembers that fiery young man, that hothead full of zeal for God, has a call of God to the Gentiles, and he's needed in this situation. Barnabas was doing a great work already in Antioch, but he knew there's someone else that can bless these people. And he goes off very unselfishly with great generosity of heart. And he looks for Saul, and he finds him in Tarsus, and he brings him back to Antioch because he knows here's a man who is called of God, who can use his gifts in this situation and in this place. And he brings Saul back in, and the Bible tells us what happens. He brought him back to Antioch and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year teaching large crowds of people. And what? It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Barnabas the encourager. We don't pay a lot of attention to him usually. But if there had not been Barnabas an encourager, very likely the greatest missionary church the world has ever known, it was the church at Antioch, really, the greatest missionary church, 
would not have been the church that it was. Without Barnabas the encourager, the man that we know as Paul, who revolutionized the world and the church, would not be the man we know him to be. It took a Barnabas for there to be a Paul. Are you a Barnabas? Are you willing to be a Barnabas? There's more here that I wish I could share, but it's time to stop this morning. I want Maybe the next time we'll go on to some other things. I want to talk about John Mark, the failure, and how Barnabas worked in his life, but we don't have time for that this morning. But I want to challenge you this morning in closing. Don't, don't lose focus. Don't start. Be a Barnabas. Be a Barnabas. We, we say, oh, I'd like to be a, a Paul. Everybody paid attention to him. Barnabas was just as valuable for the church. Barnabas was just as needed for the church. Everybody, everybody can be a Barnabas. Everybody should be a Barnabas. You know young Christians. You know new believers. Are you being a Barnabas to them? Are you encouraging them on the side of grace? Are you encouraging them on the side of holiness, in living in the eyes of the Lord, walking steadfastly with the Lord? Are you sharing and giving where there is need? Are you giving people another chance and looking at them not as, I know what you were, you did this, you did that, but you look at them and you say, but in God's hands, you can be this. Be a Barnabas. The church needs Barnabases. And when we are, God's church will grow and people will grow. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for our brother Barnabas, whom we will one day meet in heaven along with our brother Paul. And God, I pray that you would work in our hearts, work on our character, work on our nature as we submit to you and the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, that you will make us into the people you want us to be. Father, the giftings that you have given us and the service and the ministries that you have given us, help us to be open-hearted and big-hearted about those things. Lord, may we not hold on to and protectively try to keep it for ourselves, but Lord, give us eyes of faith just as Barnabas had, eyes to see and to encourage the giftings of others as well. Oh God, I pray that you would bring us alongside new and baby Christians who may be full of zeal but perhaps don't know very much or who may be struggling. And Lord, that we will come alongside just like Barnabas, just like the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside and encourages. God, make us into Barnabases. Father, may we be a church of encouragement, of encouragement. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And now, if you need to go, go, but do it quietly without chit-chatting. We want to bring our clothes, not the ones you're wearing, please keep those. <laughs> that came out the wrong way. But those of you, please hang on, hang on. Those of you that have brought clothes for the etas for the wedding, we want to bless them. And as we bring the clothes forward, we want to just take a picture as well. We're going to take, we're going to take some pictures as well. We're just going to bring it up here, and we're going to lay it up here on the platform. And then just as a physical touch point, we're just going to pray for God's blessings. So if you've brought some clothes, just bring them up now and show us some of what you have. Come on up. And then you can come. While Eileen has, show us Eileen, come on up. It's all Richards. Okay, let's see what we've got. Come on up. And Robert's going to be taking pictures. Come on up and bring them up. Oh, okay. Okay, only worn once. That's okay. It's okay. All right, let's, let's put it right here. Okay. Somebody, come on up, Tom. Wow. Okay. Brand new. Okay. Here. There <laughs> you go. Is it Iris? Okay. Is it Iris? Come on in, Pastor. New one. 
Oh, okay, wait, wait, here we go, here we go. Yes! Yeah. Let's see more. Let's see more. Three of them. Okay, come on up. Here we go. We'll put it right here. Let's see. Just turn around and show. Wow. Here we go. Oh, wow. Wow. I want to get married and on the top. I'm a, now, we have another prayer request. Pray that there won't be any fights wow. on, the, on the mountain top. Okay, what have we got here? Okay, that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. From Jonah Lynn. Oh, that's yours. Oh, that's yours. Okay. This goes together. Okay. Okay. Let's see what else. From Jonah Lynn. Hey. Come on, Jonah Lynn. You brought it up. Here we go. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I, I definitely want to get there. <laughs> Okay. And then a whole bunch of bags. Amen. Yeah, more. Okay. Oh, Miss Sylvia. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, we know some of you are going, let's pray, okay? Let's stand together, let's just stretch our hands out to the front, you can come up here if you want to, and let's pray. You know, I got to preach, does somebody have it in their hearts, does somebody want to pray? It's in your heart, your heart's just overflowing, you say, yes, yes, let me pray. I want to be a Barnabas right now. I can easily pray, somebody else, it's in your heart, you say, I want to pray for it. Anyone? Come on, Miss Bridget. I was thinking you anyhow. That's right. I really was. Okay. You can pray right there, but pray good and loud and we'll agree with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will bless these people, these men and women, husbands and wives, Lord Jesus, that they will be renewed with uh, your love, Lord Jesus. Not only are you love, but that you love and 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 that you Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. As in the past, they were seen as odd people, Lord. They would become an example of the Your glory, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And that the people around will know that You have been in in their midst, Lord. 
Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. May you be glorified in everything that will happen in these coming days. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.